Hi everyone, uh, my name is Gustav Mikkelsen and I would like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar on Hacking Exposed. During this webinar, Nixus uh, Juha Leivo, uh, together with CrowdStrike's uh, Ronald Poole, present and discuss the speed of uh, modern day in hacking tactics. Before we start, uh, I just want to make you aware of that you can send us questions uh, during the session through the question chat function. Uh, and we have reserved time in the end of this webinar to go through the questions uh, that we receive. So uh, without uh, no further ado, I will hand over to uh, Yua. Thank you, Gustav. So, hi, my name is Juha Leivo. I'm a lead security consultant at Nixus Digital Forensics and Incident Response Unit. I've been in the cybersecurity field for 15 years and uh, for the last five years in Nixu, where I'm part of the incident response team. And I'm a lead consultant over here, so I do a lot of incident responses regarding ransomware, phishing, and other kind of stuff. In addition to that, I do threat intelligence, and with that threat intelligence hat on my head, I'm today presenting for you. And the agenda for uh, for this presentation is that I'll briefly tell about Nixu and then we'll jump into the meat of the matter, which is the threat landscape update. And the threat landscape update will update end in giving you a little bit of an update on what has happened in Q3 regarding ransomware. After that, I will hand it over to Ronald in CrowdStrike, who will dig deeper into the ransomware and what can be done with that. So with this agenda set, let's get going. We, Nixu, are about 30 years old company, and we are currently focusing solely in cybersecurity. Our focus area is uh, Europe. We also have customers worldwide, of course, uh, with these times, every company is big company and working worldwide. There's about 400 of us uh, with very, very broad te technical background. So broad, in fact, that whatever is your need in cybersecurity field, we actually do it. So we've got guys from anything, uh, uh, anything cybersecurity related on the board level to all the way to deep forensic side. And I'm a rep representative of the deep forensics end, if I may say so. And since I'm a representative of that side, I don't spend a lot of time uh, selling stuff. So we go into the meat of the matter, which is the Nixu strategic threat landscape. So as I mentioned earlier, one of my hats or tasks is uh, threat intelligence, and I'm part of our threat intelligence team. Uh, we create uh, every quarter what we call a strategic threat landscape for our customers, and we deliver it, deliver it to them. So I will be giving you a high-level view of the content of this document. And uh, after that, we will, I'll end up on the ransom note, on ransomware note, and we will then go to Ronald. So our strategic threat landscape is a document that we divide into four different parts. So we have the company and industry specific part in there. So we begin in the uh, quarter always of estimating what happened to your company related in relation to changes in the landscape and what happened to the industry in general. Then we split into threats, vulnerabilities and cybercrime in the end. Since this is a generic pre pre presentation, I will not dive into a company and industry part, but I will give you uh, an angle on the uh, threat landscape, a uh, broader picture, because we don't have the back end, the uh, previous presentations to set us up for. So in broad picture, uh, broad picture, I'll give you a little bit of a different view on uh, what would be the threats and what are what it leads into. So for the threats in our bigger view, we divide into four major uh, threats. These are not by all means all the threats, but these are the big ones. So you've got phishing, which is getting credentials uh, to, uh, over simple emails. Then we have maldocs, and with maldocs, I refer to anything that has uh, any kind of document or uh, attempt to deliver a document that has a backdoor that ends up in malicious code running on the machine. Then we have vulnerabilities. So there's uh, vulnerabilities in 
applications that were not patched or were too slowly patched, which leads into exploitation of these vulnerabilities. And finally, misconfigurations as a threat. Misconfigurations here, I mean uh, twofolded. So it can be misconfiguring server applications or server configurations in general, which is the classical IT misconfiguration. But then I also refer to uh, coders and they are leaking credentials. So they've actually uh, set up a code repository so that the credentials that the code uses are in the repository and are being accidentally configured out, uh, accidentally visible to the outside world through the code repositories such as GitHub. It is also in the cloud environment, uh, what we saw for a few years is misconfiguring uh, databases, so-called NoSQL databases, which have no authentication in addition to no structure, and these were publicly exposed. So that's where the major data leaks of 2018, 2019 came from. But these have been reduced quite a bit. Still, misconfigurations is a big area. These four things usually, uh, but I, again, not always, but usually lead to business email scams. So the phishing leads into, once they got credentials, they can uh, try to get into the company email flow and then create fraudulent billing. That's the end game to gain the money. And this is one of the biggest money-wise events happening right now. So they just, uh, while well, once they get the credentials, they go into the email and create fraudulent billing. It can take multiple months for them to develop the way the company handles billing, but that's the end game in here. And it's not technically challenging. This is mainly social engineering from these guys' point of view. The other big thing that constantly happens and what is also focus of our presentation here is ransomware. This, especially this year, has become the main thing, uh, what you see in the news on how to make money. And practically all of the things mentioned in the big threats lead uh, can lead into the ransomware. To some extent, the uh, credential leaks, phishing and maldogs might lead to espionage, but that is uh, on the minor end of the scale. And of course, there's the data leaks, which come from the misconfigured databases, for example. In many cases, there is a sidestep or additional step in the game, which is the credential leaks or credential related attacks. So credential uh, sprays, for example. In these cases, uh, the credentials themselves are not the end game. If you think from your company's perspective, if someone has credentials, they have credentials, they don't have anything that would be turned into money. Those credentials always lead into email scams or ransomware or something. So they are being sold for very few uh, dollars and that leads into the bigger problems. Now with this background set up, let's walk into the way we describe threat changes. Uh, what changes have happened in the threat line uh, for the threats in Q3? So for Q3, there was a major increase in cybercrime originated ransomware. Uh, fish, uh, credential phishing and back CEO fraud, so the top three threats uh, in there. There seems to be that during the Q2, things slowed down a little bit. And if we speculate, we could say that the attackers are humans too, and the corona limitations that were all over the world affected them also. So they first had to take care of themselves before they could start attacking. And that's probably what is visible now in Q3. So once we've got uh, settled into the new norm, there's new changes in the world and the attackers are now opening up the game. So there's a major increase of attacks in Q3. What we also uh, have noticed is that there's an increase uh, uh, in the way they got into systems, which is through vulnerabilities. So uh, it seems like patching has uh, uh, slowed down a little bit, or there are new vulnerable systems being put in place to enable the remote work that the corona is, uh, has made us do all. So now it, uh, from the successful attacks, bigger part is happening through vulnerabilities on publicly accessible systems. And once the attackers are in, they've been, uh, as long as we've been doing the uh, landscape we've been constantly saying that the legitimate tools which the legitimate administrative tools which are usually referred as uh, lolbings or living on the land binaries 
their usage has, has kept increasing constantly, but uh, during the last quarter, and especially in ransomware cases, the attackers have now started using commercial tools, which were previously used almost solely by red team uh, companies during red teaming or pen testing. Especially commercial tool called Cobalt Strike is on the rise. It has been seen uh, sometimes, uh, depending on which company is reporting, they are seeing it in 50 to 70 percent of ransomware cases. When we walk into vulnerabilities on this uh, Q3, we have a couple of things changing in there. On the cloud environment, there is not a whole lot of new vulnerabilities, but the uh, misconfiguration part that is happening uh, that I discussed earlier is really represented in here. There was a research, research done, a 30-day scanning period during Q3, and they found lots of publicly accessible secrets. So they are stored in the usual places, as I mentioned earlier, code repositories such as GitHub or GitLab and S3 buckets and Azure blobs and these, which are openly searchable. We give always recommendations and in here we develop, uh, recommend maintaining a development portfolio and going through with the developers from time to time and seeing that they are not making these mistakes. These are very simple human mistakes. And for example, with code repositories, you can really easily leak a, a credentials and it's quite hard to delete, delete it from the repository actually. There's also been uh, quite a lot of abuse on Microsoft Azure, uh, especially subdomain hijacking and in targeted campaigns, they've been using Azure applications in there. The recommendations in here is the root cause for the subdomain hijacking is that when companies have been using Azure and have developed applications in there or have had sites in Azure, they haven't decommissioned it fully. So there have been there has been lingering subdomains that are still pointing to the Azure and attackers are able to place their own machines in these subdomains so that the Azure directs them to these, which places the attackers squarely on the company's own domains. Also, the Azure applications are a way to bypass the multi-factor authentication, which is increasing constantly. So we recommend limiting and monitoring what kind of Azure applications do you have on your site. Uh, vulnerabilities in itself are not a problem. When they're developed into exploits, that is the problem. Uh, Palo Alto had ma made during Q3 a major uh, evaluation of different CVEs that, are, that have public exploits. They evaluate about 11,000 CVEs and came up with uh, rather interesting information in there. So, if you're relying on the NIST CVE feed for your patching information, you are way behind uh, schedule. About 80% of the public exploits uh, are published before the CVEs from the NIST CVE feed are published. The average, uh, on average, exploit is published 23, 23 days before the CVE is published. So if your patch management is relying on the NIST CVE feed, there's a major lag in which time your uh, organization is vulnerable to these attacks. The recommendation in here is that you should get your patching information directly from the vendors themselves and not rely on uh, CVE numbers, for example, because the, that doesn't really work fast enough. On, the, uh, on another note, in the Q3, Microsoft XP source code, source code was also leaked. This was covered in the media in uh, many dismissive ways, uh, stating that if you have Microsoft Windows XP in use, uh, you already have more problems uh, than, the, uh, than the leak in this case, because the application of the operating system is no longer maintained. It has multiple known vulnerabilities and so on. We take a little bit of a different tack here. The Microsoft Windows is a very old and long code base. So the Windows, X, uh, Windows XP code exists in the Windows 10 uh, code base already, uh, even today. And uh, for example, you don't have to look any further than May of this year, when researchers published print, uh, print Demon was the name of the exploit that they came out with. And this was in the printing uh, print spooler system of the Windows. And that code was from Windows NT4 period, 
which is two Windows generations before Windows XP. And this vulnerability was present in Windows 10 also. So we are expecting that uh, over time, this will generate new, uh, new exploits against Windows, even though it's old source code. It is full source code and development of exploits against for source code is much more easier than reverse engineering features. With that, let's jump into the cybercrime. So for the Q3, we have two highlights for the cybercrime, how uh, two changes for the cybercrime what's happened in there. The first change is in phishing. Uh, the phishing campaigns have come a much shorter in duration. Now they now almost all of them seem to complete within 24 hours, 21 hours. In 2019, we could see in our monitoring uh, operations, the SOC that the attacks lasted about three days, 72 hours, and you would see three waves coming in uh, during each of these attacks. The waves would be uh, approximately one per day. Today, it's uh, squeezed down into one day or less than one day. On the positive note, uh, what we can see is the defenses work. So the systematic defenses that we have in place uh, as, uh, in general in the industry work, which is visible in that only 10% of the attacks yield results. But when they yield results, they really yield results. So 89% of all the leaked credentials come from 10% of the attacks, which means that if we look from the technical uh, uh, to tooling perspective, the tooling seems to work very well. It's squeezing down the attacks to a very, very small area. But when the tooling fails, uh, the attackers are successful. So the key here is keep the tooling in uh, place, uh, updated all the time so that the new attack methods are being caught. But there's always going to be that gap, which is covered with employee awareness training. And it practically needs to be continuous right now. This uh, phishing is one of the big continuous background noises that you will get uh, constantly against your company. So teaching your employees, making uh, phishing awareness a daily thing would be the thing that would cut down the last 10% or uh, the amount of credentials that would be leaked. The other major thing and what is uh, in this presentation is the ransomware. So in Q3, we saw a new change again in this field. The, if we look a little bit historically, 2019 at the second half, the uh, Maze group started showing a new way of dealing with the ransomware. That was the data exfiltration. So since 2019, the uh, threat has no longer been that they just encrypt your data. It is now that they will export, uh, exfiltrate data, and they will then uh, extort you for that data. The data is actually used two ways. You're requested to pay uh, for the promise that the data will not be leaked, and this is uh, a losing battle, and it is being used to increase the pressure to negotiate. So they will start leaking the data partly, constantly, until you uh, are willing to pay and negotiate. On last quarter, so the Q3, another new pressure tactic uh, came into play, and that's the denial of service attacks. So there are operators now that who will uh, use network level attacks. Once they've encrypted your network, they will attack uh, the remaining infrastructure with network uh, attacks, taking down your servers or connections to other places in attempt to make you negotiate as is visible in the screen capture. This is uh, our update on what has happened on Q3. And with this, I'll transfer uh, to Ronald to dive deep, more deeply into the ransomware scene. Good morning. So um, I'm Ronald Poole. I'm a cybersecurity specialist at CrowdStrike. I've been working at CrowdStrike for almost three years now, uh, been in the cybersecurity space uh, in multiple positions for over a decade. And today um, I'll zoom in a bit more on ransomware and the things that ransomware is bringing us, uh, the headaches and, and some recommendations on countering these. 
so first, let's take a little step back, make it a bit more abstract uh, by going to the MITRE tech framework, uh, since we will be using. Oh, no. Is it just me, or am I I'm seeing only white? Is it just me? You're only seeing white. That's not good. I'm only seeing white here. Then we've got a technical challenge. Let me kill my presentation and start it new. That is an always good solution. <laughs> Have you tried turning it on and off again? Yeah. Second stage, have you tried hitting it? Yep. Let's, let's try again. Um, there we go. Now you see the hacking no, okay. slot. Yep. Good. So going back a level to MITRE attack framework, the MITRE attack framework is a, a, a standard by the organization called MITRE, a US company, non-profit company that helps secure the internet, that has all kinds of standards for that, like sticks and taxi, uh, but also this attack framework. Uh, the attack framework is there as a living document, um, making sure that all of us at least talk the same language, speak the same uh, keywords and know what's associated with one of those keywords. So if we look at credential access there's all kinds of things that fall under credential access uh, credential access uh like brute force and key logging credential dumping and a lot more uh, than those but with that we all have like this this living document where we add new attack tactics and techniques and and have a unified language around those um i know that this slide is not really readable don't worry i'll get back in the next slide and zoom into these but in short, we also use the MITRE tech framework to map the things that we see happening in the world uh, and see which things are happening more often than others. So the more red the color in this uh, MITRE tech framework overview, the more it's happening in, in, in this case, over 2019. Um, and of course, this is continuously changing in 2020. You'll see some differences. But in general, you do see for a while already that some of these elements are really uh, focus areas of the of the adversaries of the hacker groups and are consistently being used more than others so from a defensive perspective making sure that you at least counter those things that are often used is probably a wise idea as said i would zoom in a bit to make sure that it's readable for everyone that these are the things that were most commonly observed uh, and what's standing out here is, if you look at the execution stage, et cetera, you see a lot of command line interface, PowerShell scripting, WMI, as, as previously mentioned, the, the low bins, the, the, the things that are actually on the system that the administrators are probably using, but the bad guys can use them too. And this is something that is happening still a lot. Another thing that stands out here is valid accounts. Uh, you see it for initial access, you see it also pointing to persistence, you see it also pointing to defense evasion. Um, by using legitimate accounts from users, attackers are a lot harder to spot. And of course, they need those accounts to get further into the network. Just having that endpoint which they hit with their initial phishing campaign, great, but that's probably not where the where the crown jewels of the organization are. That's not what they're after. They want to get deeper and wider into the organization. In order to do so, they need legitimate credentials to start moving around on the network. Um, that also points a bit to, to other areas here that you see like lateral movement, uh, RDP connections. Of course, in order to set up a remote desktop connection to another system, you need an account on that system. So that's where, where valid accounts are, are popping up all over. And whether they got those valid credentials from credential dumping at a, a certain stage, or whether they got them from uh, deep dark web uh, leaks and data leaks, or perhaps by doing water hole attacks, figuring out what type of users you have in your environment, trying to figure out their, their usernames and passwords for services they use, for instance, public cloud services, and then trying whether the credentials used in your environment are the same. In the end, that's pretty irrelevant. If they have legitimate credentials, 
you need to monitor the usage of those credentials and you probably need something more enhanced like if we see a certain situation which is not okay or at least doubtful you may want to ask for multi-factor authentication we'll get back to some recommendations in a bit but multi-factor authentication is definitely something which is really helpful for for that area so let's look at some current threats and as i said the focus of today's session is going to be ransomware because although there is enough to be said about nation state attacks and all kinds of other attacks i think for most organizations nowadays ransomware is top of mind and is the thing that a lot of organizations do worry about most because it is happening so often and one of the trends that we see here is that ransom sums get bigger and bigger um, into the millions as you can see here these are actually ransoms that we know have been paid and this is a lot of money and that's i guess the the, the main trigger here it is a very commercial business it is about making money that's what they do and if you look at the numbers that they make here this also shows that they are being pretty effective and i guess that points us to the next part here the trend the rich get richer because they are effective with their ransomware campaigns they get more money they can buy more tooling they can optimize their processes and they can get better qualified and more staff and with that do more campaigns get richer and the circle keeps more spinning in that direction so it's up to us as good guys of course to prevent this from from that wheel from spinning we need to slow that down we need to stop that circle um but as you can see the these are these guys are professionals these are these organizations are nowadays run like professional organizations and with that they they yeah are are becoming harder to stop for a lot of organizations unless we change that so one of the things that you see here on the bottom line is hands-on activity is increased and this means that hackers are actually remotely hacking into your system and manually doing actions it's not just shooting ransomware somewhere and it needs to land and automatically things happen it's actually attackers remotely behind the keyboard um, making sure that stuff works and that they can get wide and deep into that environment because that's probably the biggest change if you compare ransomware nowadays with a couple of years ago a couple of years ago it was all spray and pray send it out to as many email addresses as you could get your hands on and just hope someone clicks it uh, now it's very targeted get into an organization um, with probably hands-on remote remote hands-on keyboard activity go wide and deep into that organization infect as many systems as you can without actually making the ransomware go off um, and then at some point preferably during holidays we, we see a trend during holidays that, that they actually do plan that so with the holiday season coming up for all of us um, they know that we probably have a skeleton staff everywhere when it comes to security. Uh, there's a there's only a minimal number of people working and probably remotely, and that's what they use and abuse, of course. Because at that point, if you then encrypt all those systems, exfiltrate data, and with that pressure the organization to pay up, um, there's a fair chance that they'll get their money. So ask yourself the question first who is your threat if you don't know who you're up against how are you going to protect yourself against it trying to fight off the entire world is always a much harder battle than having a targeted defense plan and if you look at the current threat actor landscape uh, it is becoming pretty complex it is a supply chain certain threat actors run certain pieces of code others create pieces of code and then have it as a service available to other actors and that kind of thing so it's it's a lot that's going on there and if you don't know what's happening further up in their supply chain how are you going to defend yourself against what's coming up next so keeping an eye out on these kind of threat landscape elements uh, can make sure that you even though um, a certain threat actor has, has its targets on you you know what's coming probably for that threat actor in their evolution um, threats differ per sector threats differ per region so having a good understanding of what's relevant for you is always a, a good key uh, element for a good security posture um if you want to know more as said nixo has has information on threat landscape 
you can also download our, our global threat report freely from our website, which gives you a lot of these details and insights too. And I always say when it comes to threat intelligence, you can never have enough good threat intelligence only to verify things with each other and, and strengthen your confidence in, in the assessment with that. So uh, feel free to use both or even more sources. So how do we respond to threats? First of all, if this happens, ask yourself the question up front. If we are going to get hit by ransomware, what are we going to do? Are we going to do this ourselves? Are we going to be able to fix this? Are we going to pay the ransom? Or are we going to get help? And I'll dive a bit deeper into ransomware and then ask you the question again uh, with, with the knowledge that you hopefully have gained by that point, uh, if you haven't had that knowledge so far. But most importantly, do think of these scenarios up front and don't get surprised by it and then act in emotion, panic, and those kind of things. If you look at some of the biggest organizations uh, out there and, and, and the site information is beautiful, it's, it's a great site where you can actually get visualizations like this, like what are the biggest data breaches in the world, <clears throat> in, in, the, in the history of, of the internet pretty much, and then filter like, okay, let's look at the ones that have been hacked. And suddenly you see that there's still a lot of these that actually have a hacking component to it. Uh, and these are big companies. And these companies all had antivirus. These companies all had their firewalls. They probably had next gen firewalls. Some of them even had good EDR solutions. And still this happened. So why is this happening? Um, there's a couple of reasons, but one of them that we often encounter is definitely this one. This is what an average SOC engineer feels like at days. There are so many screens, there's so many dashboards and everything's happening all over the place. It is too easy to miss one or two things. We need to tie all those data sources together and figuring it out every time, time and time again, and be right all the time. Because it only takes one miss for the bad guys to be successful. Now, let's talk a bit more about that ransomware. If we look at the suggestion of paying the ransom, that doesn't solve it all. Paying the ransom is a big amount of the money, but let's not forget if you pay the ransom, you still need to do some work with machines that don't work anymore. You still probably need to recover some backups. You still need to do your forensics because you want to be sure that that threat actor is out because you paid him is no guarantee that he stopped targeting you. You don't want this to happen again a couple of months from now. And probably most importantly, the bottom one, you still need to make sure that it doesn't happen again from that same threat actor or from another threat actor. So the leaks that you have in your security, the gaps that they abuse still need to be plugged. So you need to update your security tools. You need to review your processes and procedures. You may need to critically look at your security staff. Are these the right people? Do they have the right knowledge? Do we need external help? Do we need to do skill them up and train them up? Do we maybe need additional people? All in all, there's a lot of extra cost. And unfortunately, the let's call it funny part here is if this would have been done, that last step up front, that attack probably never would have happened in the first place anyway. So if you look at all these dollar signs, most of them are actually things that you need to pay <clears throat> if a ransomware attack hits you, but if you would have skilled up, tooled up, etc., before, the cost in the end is, of course, a lot lower. So let's talk a bit about our time to respond to threats. But before we go into that in more detail, some recommendations when it comes to, to, to this ransomware threat that we all face. <clears throat> First of all, a lot of organizations do have tools in place, but have outdated tools or have tools that they only rolled out to a certain piece of the estate or haven't enabled all security features because it's something that we still need to do at some point, but it's not a priority. Or a project only had this scope and there's actually more to the product that could actually help our security posture, but yeah, there's other priorities. So maximize what you have is always a good start because not doing everything with what you have in house is probably a, a waste of, of money, pretty much a waste of investment, but also um, some of these tools can really help you enhance your security posture. Uh, and if you have the tools, but don't really use it, you leave a gap open. 
as said before, multi-factor authentication, very important. Um, and, and if you look at zero trust models, et cetera, you can also make this very smart and dynamic. Like if we see a system which is now considered potentially compromised, any user that has logged on to that system for the last seven days, we want uh, a multi-factor authentication for any session for X time, because we want to make sure that it's actually that user and not a stolen credential, for instance. Those kind of things are all part of making sure that you handle credentials well. Um, legitimate tools, as said, are being abused, so do monitor their usage. Too many organizations just don't look at how PowerShell is being used in their environment, for example, while the attackers do use that. Social engineering, of course, still happening a lot, so train those users, keep training them. Uh, at some points, it will feel hopeless, and if you do one of those tests you'll see everyone clicked on that link it's still worth it keep training them if you can't do this yourself in-house if you can't make this secure consider outtasking this there's good security partners in there, there there's there's nixu there there's us there's there's some others but if you don't have the capabilities in-house <clears throat> don't just ignore it uh, the worst strategy is putting your, your your head into the sand and hoping it will just blow past you if this hits you it will hit hard so with that in mind um i'd ask you again perhaps reconsider if you can do this in-house perhaps reconsider if paying the ransom is the right approach and maybe get help up front and assessing where you stand with your security and doing it better up front to save those costs in the long run. So let's talk a bit about that speed, as I promised. We need to speed up, in all honesty, because if we look at what's happening currently, we've, did a, we've done a survey in over 1900 uh, organizations worldwide uh, with IT management asking how they actually did when it comes to security, detecting, analyzing, and responding to a threat. And what we saw is on average, it's taking 161 hours to go through that entire cycle. And we still sometimes see these cases in the media, right? Or in all honesty, if we look at our incident response investigations, we see threats that have been in there for months and months before they were actually detected. But even then, an attacker being in there for 120 hours before he gets detected, that's a lot of time to do a lot of bad stuff. So what we actually think is you should speed up to what we call a one to six year old. One minute to detect, 10 minutes to analyze, 60 minutes to respond to that threat. And I know coming for 161 hours, going to approximately an hour sounds unbelievable and, and unattainable. But let's not forget, it all starts with that first stage. And that was by far the, the stage that took longest. How long do you take to detect? With the right tooling, right staffing, the right processes in place, you can be so much faster in detecting. And if you're fast in detecting, your analysis and response will follow. So getting that first stage right with the right tooling, right people, maybe the right outsourcing or outtasking is probably your biggest gain. So before I dive into any detailed questions, I would say analyze first. If you have your current detection times not measured, start measuring it so that you know what slows you down. As soon as you know what slows you down, you can also start tweaking and tuning. And it might be something as simple as perhaps our response is slow because we've got change processes in place so that any incident responder that finds a threat, analyzes it, now needs to respond, needs to get three different signatures before he can actually do something. That's something that should be very easily solvable, right? That's something that should not hinder an experienced incident responder from mitigating a threat quickly. So with that, I'll go to our last slide to point out another presentation that will be happening soon from Nixu. And I'll open yep. up the floor for any questions. Thank you, Jua and uh, Ronald. Uh, so we received a few questions here. Uh, we can start with the first one. Uh, um, so I will uh, read it out loud here. 
uh, like meter attack uh, matrix is there any defense uh, uh, matrix against mm -hmm. ettps and if so is there any solutions that we um, recommend want to take on that? Um, yeah go ahead well we analyze the uh, meter framework quite a bit and uh, on threat intelligence side we're working on uh, the ways to detect. So uh, the Mitra, the documentation on Mitra side actually has these are ways to detect it, and they are quite high level uh, solutions because for different EDR tools, the visibility is different. Uh, different things are visible in different logs. You need to change log configurations. There are multiple security companies that do this kind of stuff, but there is not that I know of any kind of this is how you defend against the uh, attacks that are described in Mitra attack, but the Mitra attack itself contains to a degree how what you should look, what what you should do. Then different companies uh, do mapping just like Ronald showed, but like this tool covers these TTPs, Windows locking covers these TTPs. That kind of material can be found. Yeah, if I look at from, from our perspective, um, I would say CrowdTrack is most well known for being an EDR tool, right? We do other things, but EDR is, is uh, the core of, of a lot of things we do. Um, and when you look at EDR tooling, it checks a lot of boxes in the MITRE attack framework, but it doesn't check everything because EDR means endpoint detection response. So we reside on that endpoint. Anything happening network related, we can of course with that not see. So the combination of an EDR and NDR, for instance, would already cover even more. And with that, there there's some 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 different solutions that you need and let's not forget the MITRE attack framework is also a living uh let's call it dictionary it is evolving as attacks are evolving um so something that covers it perfectly now might not cover it perfectly in a year from now so staying on top of things tracking it and and perhaps having periodic sessions with your security partner to see do we have decent coverage and also does that coverage map to what's relevant for us as an industry, as an organization, uh, in the regions that we're at, uh, does make sense there. Okay, thanks guys. Um, we have uh, one additional question. Um, what about the police? If there is a breach, um, should I report it to the police? Yeah, so stopping the cycle, this is like the ransomware ecosystem is spinning up constantly. It's still increasing. And one of the things that uh, seems to be the problem is that companies don't know how to report to police or don't know should they report to police. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't need to ask, should we report? It's a crime if you report it to the police. This is, uh, if, we report, if the companies would report this to the police and they would report this to the national certs, that would give all the uh, international organizations and national organizations data points so that we can start over uh, boundaries, over country boundaries, figuring out where these groups are and starting to shut them down. They can be shut down as long as information is given out that you're being targeted and uh, the, all the IOCs, so indicators of compromise, are given out. They'll slowly start adding up and these players will be exposed. But for what I know, uh, the companies usually don't do, and they don't. Their own communication plans or uh, response plans are focused on themselves. It doesn't have the external component reporting to police or reporting to CERT. How about yeah, you, we, Ronald? Christine? Yeah, we definitely work together with law enforcement to to close down as many of these threat actors as possible by collecting evidence, etc. And we do that as much as we can. Unfortunately, some of them are very hard to be stopped because there's like a relationship with the nation that they're in. Um, yep. Sometimes they're even part of the, the, I would say, economic ecosystem of a country. They, they actually generate revenue for that country. So that country is never gonna hand those individuals over to another country. Those are some risks that you see. So it is unfortunately currently uh, something that you can't get a hundred percent catch rate, but not uh, handing them over to the police, not giving the police the information, not reporting it, is is not going to help at all. So the more pressure we put on this, the more 
of those bits and pieces that get together and the more visibility it gets, the better it is in the long run to at least enhance our catch rates. Yep. Thanks. Uh, we uh, have reached the top of the hour, so time to, to wrap up. Um, if you would like to have more information and insight about uh, endpoint detection and response, uh, I recommend you to join our EDR webinar on the 3rd of uh, December, uh, where we will discuss uh, the holistic view on uh, cybersecurity, uh, economical impact uh, of not having control um, of um, the security situation, and also the current threat landscape in uh, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and the Netherlands. Uh, the registration link uh, will be sent to you in a follow up email tomorrow morning. And uh, in the email, you will also have the full recording of this webinar. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, comment in the survey uh, before closing your browser. And we will reach out to you as soon as possible. And uh, thank you, everybody, uh, from my side. And uh, have a good day. <laughs>